Our last speaker for this session is uh, Professor Krishna Madhili, who was uh, uh, for a long time at IMSC. So we are happy to welcome him back. Uh, he is now at Ashoka. Krishna. Yeah, thank you for the invitation for giving a talk here. Uh, I thank all my former colleagues here. <clears throat> we have seen an, a, 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 an impressive talk which requires so much of infrastructure and so on. In comparison, you see that all we need is a pen and paper. So what I'm going to talk about is a, a simple looking statement, something called de regularity of density of states. We would have studied in calculus, everyone would have studied. You take functions, you ask whether they're continuous, they have derivatives. And all I'm going to talk about is one such question. I have one function. Does it have derivatives? Is it continuous? That's all the talk is. But it has a origin from something else. So if you take crystalline materials with impurities, you know, semiconductors and such are formed out of these things. You have a crystal. It certain uh, kind of impure impurities exist. So they conduct electrons for certain energies. They don't conduct for others. Or they are perfect metals and so on. So such materials are formed by atoms. And such materials are described by random Schrodinger operators in mathematics. Mathematically, a quantum mechanical system is described by a set of states, which is a Hilbert space, and then some sulfur giant operators on them, which are supposed to be observed. This is the quantum theory that is evolved by physicists and formalized by mathematicians. So what we have is a set of states on R3. You look at the set of square integrable functions. That means take all those functions from R3 to complex numbers whose absolute square is finite. So that is the Hilbert space. So on that Hilbert space, one has a collection of sulfur giant operators parameterized by a parameter omega. So h omega for a fixed omega is a sulfur giant operator given by the Laplacian, negative of the Laplacian, which is nothing but sum of second partial derivatives in each direction, plus some random potential which comes from for every x, v omega x for a fixed omega is a function given by a sum like this. I'll explain to you what this is in a moment. So the operator v omega is nothing but multiplication by this function on a state, f. So if f is a state, v omega f is v omega x times f of x. So that is the linear transformation. So this sum is supposed to give an energy operator that's supposed to describe the energy of the state that is responsible for its evolution, motion, and such. This is the uh, basic framework of quantum mechanics. So here, what I do is R3, I'm just representing the plane. You just form unit cubes. You take a unit cube located at the point with integer coordinates n. n here means n1, n2, n3, three integers. So look at the integer coordinate points in R3, which is nothing but Z3. At every point, you look at a unit cube centered at it. So take such unit cubes piled up next to each other. In any one cube, indexed by its center, lambda n is a unit cube centered at n. And this function, chi lambda n x, is the indicator function of that lambda n. That is, it is a function which is 1 on lambda n and 0 elsewhere. Look at that function. Multiplied by a random variable, q omega of n. Omega is a random parameter. Omega comes from a probability space. So look at the collection of random variables, q omega of n, with the property q omega at distinct points are independent and identically distributed random variables. So in other words, this is just a sum of independent random variables multiplied by projections or multiplication by indicator functions. So that is a fancy way of telling you that at 
a cube centered at n, you have a random variable q omega of n. At a cube centered at m, you have a random variable q omega of m. These are all independent. So in other words, each independent cube has independent random variables. So you can think of this as atoms piled up at the centers of these cubes, unit cubes, and each atom is a different type. And that's what describes the impurity. Most of them may be the same. So the independentness says it's a random system. And this totality of this collection of atoms, where you could have all kinds of impurities, is the model that is modeling the energy operator, where the parameter omega tells you that the impurities could be somewhere. I don't know where it is. For example, if I buy a copper uh, material from one shop in Tinagar and another shop in Adyar, they may have different kind of impurities. So the omega will be different. However, in general, for all these things, the properties, generic properties should be the same. This copper wire or copper material that I buy in Adya should conduct electricity as well as the one that I buy in Tinagar, for example. So that is the kind of statement one is looking for. So independent of the parameters, some properties should be valid. Okay? So this object, this self-adjoint operator is the one that describes the quantum mechanical system. Q omega n's are independent and identically distributed. When you say it's a random variable, it must have a distribution. So the distribution is given by a function h of x, which is its density. In other words, the probability that this random variable takes value in an interval a, b is nothing but integral of h of x dx over a, b. That's what it is, okay? So that is the model. So whenever you have a self-adjoint operator, you have a spectral projection associated with it. Spectral. Uh, uh, not only a spectral projection, there's projection valued measure associated with it. So if you don't understand it, just think of the matrix, uh, uh, of the operator as a matrix, a Hermitian matrix, or a symmetric matrix, real symmetric matrix. It has eigenvalues. Eigen projections are there corresponding to the eigenvalues. So the diagonal matrix that you can di uh, you get after diagonalizing it is precisely a fancy of writing sum of lambda i pi, where pi are the spectral projections. So when you don't have eigenvalues, but you have other kind of spectrum, you have a spectral measure, namely for any interval like minus infinity to e, you can asso associate a spectral uh, project orthogonal projection associated with the circular joint operator associated with that interval. And this will be a projection. And as a function of the interval, this is a measure taking values and projection, okay? So what we have is we take the spectral projection associated with the operator corresponding to a number E. By the way, self-adjoint operators have spectrum only in the real line, not outside. And therefore, it just makes sense. You take the unit cube centered at zero, look at this function that is supported there. Think of it as a projection on the Hilbert space. Multiply that with the spectral projection, you get another operator. Take the trace of this, that will give you a number. So for each E, you get a number, but then that number is a random variable because omega is there. So you simply take the average. So take the average of the trace of this operator, which is a function of omega. So for every E, you get a number. So for every E here, you get a number. Call it N of E. So as a, E varies, it's a function. So this function is called by physicists as the integrated density of states. Okay? Or it's called a cumulative distribution function. So it is this function that one is going to look at. By the way, this is the work that I did with my former PhD students, Dhiti Dalai and Anish Malik, if I forget to say it later. So n is the distribution function of a finite measure. And when it is absolutely continuous, we can write this function as 
the integral with respect to some density n, n of x. And this n is what is called the density of states. Okay. All right. So there is another way to describe this, which is a more intuitive way, which is how the physicists describe it. You restrict h omega to a box of size lambda l in three dimensions, centered at zero. And because you are restricting it to a box, it's like restricting the Laplacian to the box. So it has only eigenvalues. Take the Laplacian and in a bounded domain, if you restrict it, you only have eigenvalues. And therefore, this has only eigenvalues. And uh, HL of omega is bounded below because the Laplacian is bounded below. Its spectrum starts at zero. And when you put a densely boundary condition, it starts at zero, but nine one conditions, it will move up. It doesn't matter, but it's still bounded below. So these eigenvalues are bounded below. And therefore, if I count the eigenvalues below some number e, there are only finitely many eigenvalues. Because the Laplacian restricted to a box has discrete set of eigenvalues. They don't accumulate anywhere. And therefore, in any bounded interval, these are only finitely many numbers. So there are finitely many numbers. And look at these numbers and count them. Number is number of eigenvalues below E of HL of omega for a fixed L. This is a finite number. There are reasons why this behaves like the volume of the box. That's called Weyl's formula, asymptotic formula. So this number is like uh, L to the power 3 proportionate to L to the power 3, the volume of that box. And look at this object, call that NL omega V. Now this, now this function now depends on omega, it is not independent, okay. And secondly, a, a simpler way to look at it is, look at the eigenvalues of HL of omega, at, e, at each eigenvalue you put a weight 1 by L to the 3, that will give you some measure and that is the measure one is looking at. So this is a collection of random functions with de depending on L and omega for every E. So under very mild conditions on the distribution of the random variables Q omega, it is known that N of E is a continuous function and NL omega V as L goes to infinity converges to N almost every omega. So this statement is stated as self-averaging property of these finite cumulative distribution functions by physicists. So this statement is an ergodic statement for a mathematician, but for a physicist it's called self-averaging. So hence, expectation of NL of omega V also converges to the same thing because independent of omega it converges. So when you take averages, they can watch. So n is absolutely continuous and the density of states and ideas related by n of e, this is the density of n, which is this relation almost every e. So here is the question. Is the density of states n of e continuous? Is it differentiable? If so, how many times? That is all the question is. By the way, it took 30 years for, a, for me to prove this. Nobody could prove it. So sometimes simple questions are hard. So the question in, uh, is unsolved for random Schrodinger operators. While it was solved for Anderson model, tight bending model, which is the same model on L2 of Z3, which is an approximation to the Schrodinger operators. Instead of taking the Laplacian here, you take the adjacency operator, which is just uh, taking the derivative on, on the lattice. If you write it down, you just the adjacency and then the random variables at different sites. Now, these boxes are replaced by integer points themselves. Indicate the functions there, there are regular orthonormal vectors there and so on. So, this is a well-defined operator 
and in the region of the spectrum that consists only of eigenvalues, uh, here Ti is the right shift. So, for the uh, for information, in the case of a Schrodinger operator, random Schrodinger operator, the spectrum looks like from 0 to infinity it is something and at the below you have only eigenvalues. Now, it is an open problem in more than two dimensions, more than one dimension, what the nature of the spectrum on the right hand side is, nobody knows. Even in the discrete case, nobody knows what the nature of the spectrum is if the variance of H is small. So, that are, those, those are the major open problems in mathematical physics. So, I am going to look at only in this region, not, not, not there. Even that is an open problem for this question. So, I will be looking at this part called the closure of the set of eigenvalues of H of omega. So, who's, how long do I have? Do I have some time? Five minutes, okay. Five minutes is not much time. So, here is the thing. Uh, I will try to tell you the main idea. The main idea is that it is known that if you take the resolvent, if, the, if you take the current inverse of this operator after subtracting a complex number z, then this is an invertible operator. You take the inverse, multiply the projections at distinct points lambda n and lambda m, take the trace, take the absolute value for some small power, take the expectation, then that decays exponentially as n and m go to infinity, as the difference goes to infinity. This is a property in the region where the point spectrum exists. This is a fact. Okay. So, our theorem is that whenever you are in this part of the spectrum where this is valid for real z in this point spectrum. So, whenever you are in the closure of set of eigenvalues where this condition is valid, n of e has m continuous derivatives whenever h has m plus 3 continuous derivatives. Remember that earlier it was not even known whether n is continuous or not. So, the idea of the proof is any positive finite measure h of x dx has what is called a still j transform. You take 1 over x minus z h of x dx which is this function. It is a function of a complex number z. That is a function in the upper half plane. It has some nice properties. So, for proving what I want to prove about h, all I have to do is prove some things on f s of z. So, if this is differentiable in z, and the derivative is uniformly bounded in imaginary z in an interval, then automatically h is differentiable in that interval. Okay. So, this is what the idea that we use. And the second step that we use is that if I take a sequence a n numbers and that converges to some number a, then you can write the limit a as a telescoping sum take a, a 2 minus a 1 plus a 3 minus a 2 and so on plus a 1, that sum is precisely a, which is the limit of the sequence. So, what we do is, this is the object we have to look at. So, we write it as a telescoping sum with respect to those things that we restrict to different boxes. This is the L plus 1 box, that is L box and so on. Write it as a telescoping sum and then uh, use the fact that any of these things for a fixed L has this form, it is a function of model lambda L random variables integrated over corresponding densities. Therefore, if I want to take a derivative of this whole function in E, that is simply as taking derivative on Hs by integrating by parts. Therefore, whenever H has a number of derivatives, this function for a fixed L has as many derivatives in real Z. Okay. Therefore, in the previous slide, I don't know, no. In the previous slide here, sorry, here, this function whose derivative I want to know 
I am writing it as an infinite sum of some functions for whose for which I know that they have derivatives. Now it's a question of analysis and math and showing that there is some absolute and uniform convergence of these summons here. You take the absolute value of things that were inside the sum, certain uniformity and so on you have to prove and that completes the proof and that's what we do. Now when I describe to you it appears simple but firstly you have to get an idea. Secondly, anyway, uh, secondly you note that I have something like this average of some quantity but I only have a condition that the quantity that is inside the summand only power s, s smaller than half is finite and decaying exponentially. So if I have a, it's like saying that integral of g of x has to be bounded by integral of g of x to the power s should get an upper bound. That's almost impossible. Right? So that is a difficulty. And how do we do it? Somehow in this context it seems to work out. So there are lots of technical difficulties, which is why it wasn't proved for such a long time. And we managed to do it, which is one theorem I'm proud of. There's another theorem I'm proud of, which probably another time I'll talk. Uh, let me say that yeah, these were the two papers that were proved in the 85 and 88. Afterwards, nothing happened. And this is our paper. And this is the paper that gives the condition that we use on exponential decay. Thank you, Krishna, and thanks to all the speakers.